Hi, this is Russ Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. Welcome to the Baseline Bible Course, a 52-week course uh, designed and configured to cause you to survive and thrive in changing times. Today is Lesson 12, where we're going to conclude a three-part conversation in the last three lessons, counting this one, about what the Holy Spirit does. He lives on the inside of you, but he has something that he's doing. He has a purpose to fulfill, and it's to convict of, of uh, sin, righteousness, and judgment. And we've covered sin and righteousness in the last two lessons. And now we're going to talk about the judgment of Satan. If you would like to have this course in its entirety, you can find it on uh, fathersheartmedia.com in either paperback or ebook format. Now, John 16, 7, Jesus makes a statement. He says, I tell you the truth, it's expedient for you that I go away, because if I go not away, the Comforter will not come. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Now, Jesus went away via the cross. He spilled his blood in order to make a way for the Holy Spirit to take up residence in your heart. He wasn't interested in living in a box called the Ark of the Covenant. Excuse me, Indiana Jones. Uh, he wants to live in your heart. Uh, you're his address. You're his zip code. He wants to live in your heart, and he wants to pursue a threefold agenda. What's the agenda of the Holy Spirit living in you? John 16, 8 says, when the Holy Ghost shows up, he's going to reprove of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The subjects of sin and righteousness were covered in two previous lessons. Now let's see how the Holy Spirit seeks to convince us of judgment. I think you'll find it's a little different than you might expect. He says, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Verse 11, John 16. Now wait a minute. How about of judgment because you've been such a rascal and you know that God's going to get you sucker? Is that what he's saying? No. When, he when we think of judgment, we're always turning the lens of divine scrutiny upon ourselves. But when the lens of divine scrutiny turns to you, he sees the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. The judgment that he's talking about is not your judgment. I'm not saying there, there is no accountability. You theologians out there, you armchair theologians, get over yourself because that's not what I'm saying. But this verse is saying that the judgment the Holy Spirit comes to convict of is because the prince of this world is judged. The prince of the world here refers to the devil who holds a limited power over the earth because of Adam's sin. The Holy Spirit within you will continually affirm to you that the devil's work was condemned by Jesus upon the cross. So when you think about the devil or when you feel like you've come under the scrutiny of the devil, you just turn around and tell him, uh, What's it like to play for the losing team? The Holy Spirit will eliminate the word of God to you and cause you to understand and to truly see that Satan is a defeated foe. It's not like the little lady who stands up uh, to give a testimony and says, I just want to praise God. The devil's been after me all week. Bless his holy name. Okay, that's not what we're talking about. The Holy Spirit comes to declare to you and to affirm to you that Satan is defeated. He's weak and he's an ineffective opponent of the throne of God. And if you are in the God that lives on the throne, and you are, you're in God, God's in you, then he is in you through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And you're a partaker of the dominion of God over Satan. You see... In God's linear purpose through time, there is a throne and 24 elders and four, four living creatures around the throne. But in God's purpose on the inside of you, you have 24 ribs, which speak of 24 elders, and your heart has four chambers that speak of the four living creatures. It's God taking your body and making it a biological statement of where his throne is and where his dominion issues from. And his dominion rests upon you. Matthew 12, 29 says, Jesus said, How are you going to enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods unless you first bind the strong man? Jesus is speaking here of demonic powers that afflict men. Jesus came to earth to bind the strength of evil. 
He came to stop Satan and to spoil Satan's house. It was Adam's house. Adam sinned and it became Satan's house. When Adam caved in to Satan's temptation, he advocated his God-given rights to the earth. When he, when he caved in, the devil did a change of address and his address became Adam's address because of Adam's sin. Because of Adam's failure, the whole world became Satan's house. In effect, Adam leased the earth that God put under his stewardship to Satan. But God held the first option to buy. When Jesus came, it was God in Christ who entered the strong man's house and during the three years of his earthly ministry, Jesus spoiled his house. And at the cross, Jesus paid. He exercised his option to buy you as a purchased possession. He paid the sin debt in full and he canceled Satan's access to your life. Luke 10, 18, Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. You see, Satan operates in a spiritual dimension known as heaven. The spiritual realm, this spiritual realm is a creation of God intended originally as the administrative base from which Adam would superintend the affairs of the earth. But when Adam fell, Satan appropriated this throne or this power of, of administration over the earth and he stamped all creation with his image. Jesus came and he lived a perfect human life thereby invalidating Satan's legal access to what Adam put into his control 4,000 years before. That's why Paul describes Jesus as the last Adam and the second man. You can look that up in 1 Corinthians 15, 45. Jesus reappropriated for man the dominion Adam gave to Satan as a consequence of his disobedience. At that moment when Jesus came to earth, a man named Jesus was seated on the throne from which Satan had perverted God's creation for 4,000 years. And Luke eleven twenty two says, The strong man is defeated when a stronger than him shall come upon him and overcome him. Jesus is the one that was stronger. And he came upon the enemy, he took all of his armor wherewith he trusted and divided his spoil. The restoration of human dominion upon the earth is one of the spoils of Jesus' victory on the cross. Most people mistakenly view the kingdom of God and the domain of darkness as equal yet opposite powers. But understand that the domain of darkness is not equal to the kingdom of God. Satan is a created, limited, and finite being. He has a beginning and an ending. His powers are limited. God in us is infinite and his kingdom is unlimited. Satan's kingdom is bounded. God's kingdom is unbounded. His kingdom, Satan's kingdom, is bounded by the kingdom of God on every side. If you were to traverse the domain of darkness from pole to pole, you would find the kingdom of God at either boundary. He's contained. God's kingdom is the containment that encapsulates and diminishes the domain of darkness. In John 12, 31, Jesus said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Satan's limited power was destroyed over the lives of men after the cross. Men continue to be tormented by Satan because of ignorance, because they reject God's plan of restoration through Christ. When man rebels against God, his only option is to submission to the domain of darkness. This is because man was not created as an independent entity. Man is an image bearer. He will bear either the image of one spiritual being or the other, either God or the devil. Man is a mirror, God is light. If there is no light, then man is in darkness, and Satan is the prince of darkness. It's either or. The man that accepts Christ as Savior receives light and can then reflect the full spectrum of God's purpose for blessing and goodness. You can live above the influence, my friend, of the domain of darkness. Hebrews 2.14 tells us, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, Jesus also partook of flesh and blood, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil. Jesus defeated the devil on his own ground. He beat the devil at his own game. The devil gained control over all flesh because of Adam's disobedience. But Jesus came, born of flesh and blood, and overcame Satan in his own native realm of authority. 
We, even with the handicap of being a man, Jesus successfully competed with Satan. He didn't use any ability to overcome Satan that he didn't intend to make available to you and I through the shedding of his blood. As flesh and blood, Jesus limited himself to only exercising that power that he planned to make available to you and me. As a born-again believer conducting your life in the same context that Jesus conducted his, you do not have to accept peril and headache that the devil throws your way. By faith in the blood of Christ and bold prayers of hope, you can overcome. See, there's going to come a time that Jesus is going to set up his kingdom as a physical power on the earth, and Satan will be permanently removed. That's what Revelation 20.10 talks about, that the, the he that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever. But in the meantime, the enemy is an adversary that we are well equipped in the name of Jesus to overcome. Ephesians 6.12 says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. In this life, never be misled into seeing your struggle as being primarily physical, financial, or relational. People are not the problem. Poverty is not the problem. The problem is an unseen enemy trying to gain ground over you that Jesus died to gain on your behalf. You can rise up in prayer and faith and verbally forbid the enemy from touching your life. God has put the backing of his kingdom behind your prayers. The Holy Spirit within you will consistently affirm to you that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Who are you going to believe? The author of your bad circumstance or the author of your salvation? Be bold, called Abasa Ramasa. Stand against the enemy's lie. You will find all of heaven will back your prayers and miracles will begin to happen as you accept and come into agreement with the Holy Spirit's abiding conviction and communication of that conviction within you that the enemy of your soul has been judged and defeated by the blood of the cross. Now remember you can get this entire course at fathersheartmedia.com. It's available in paperback and ebook form. We bless you next week.